Welcome to another RD Works Learning Lab. Today we're in a little bit of a glazed unit here uh, because we don't need to be in the workshop, so it's a little bit echoey. But hey, I'm sure that won't worry you by the time you get to all the facts at the end of this saga. Here we have all my mammoth work associated with lenses so far. This is the data pack, which I was beginning to add more to. Now there were two major unanswered questions from this, and I called them question A and question B. Question A was really what happens when our laser beam passes through a lens, and question B is what is actually occurring when the beam hits the work material. Neither of those questions was really answered in here. I was hoping to get some patterns from all the data that I'd produced that would lead me to some sort of answer to these questions. Sadly, I failed. And so, where we finished up last time was a continuation of this, trying to get more patterns that would point me in the right direction. And then I went on holiday. One of those things I had to do because my wife dragged me away to a nice warm climate so I could sit around all day and do nothing and recover from this laser workshop that I've got out there. Yes, I went into a semi-comatose state with a glass of wine, coffee, sitting by the pool. Um, but that allowed my two grey cells to somehow communicate with, with each other. And rubbing together, they produced a spark. Here's the end result of that spark. I think I know what goes on. I can answer questions A and B, and a lot more questions as well now. So, today, I'm going to let you guys share what, in a few milliseconds, passed through my mind. It does just indicate how powerful the brain is, because what I saw in a few milliseconds is probably going to take me half, three quarters of an hour to explain to you guys, because I've got to lay everything out in a nice logical order right from the beginning with a very basic approach to the problem. If you understand the basic building blocks, then you will be able to understand the final concept that I've come up with. Now in doing this, we're gonna to be touching on a little bit of maths, a little bit of material science, and some optical science. Now, please don't get worried, because I'm sure you guys know by now, my mathematical ability is about ankle deep. And my scientific ability, in terms of chemistry and physics, is even shallower than that. So I'm not going to go into anything technical. It'll all be based on um, pictures and trying to create some images in your mind that you can understand and fit together. Now, in 95% of my work, it's all exploratory. It's as we go. There's nothing prepared. It's just follow my nose. In this particular instance, I've got to lay it out in very logical order. And so consequently, I've already prepared a PDF document here, which will go along with this video. And I'm going to follow this quite closely, because if I deviate from these logical steps, we might lose some of you along the way. Some of it will be very basic, and I can't apologise for that, because some people will be unfamiliar with some of the scientific principles that I'm going to explain. And others, it will be like kindergarten stuff. So bear with me. The bit at the end is the bit you really want to get to, but you have to have the building blocks before we get there. Now this first part is all about materials. Some materials we can cut and deal with, others we cannot. Why is it that we can't cut all materials with the same parameters? Well. That's partly what we're going to deal with in this session as well. The very basic element of all materials is something I'm sure that everybody's heard of, an atom. Now there are 96 different types of atoms that are naturally occurring in the world. Now 96 doesn't sound too many when we look at around us at all the materials that you can see. You think, how on earth can you make all those materials from 96 atoms? Well, it does depend on the combination of the atoms. You can get atoms that combine with themselves. You can get atoms that combine with other atoms. You can get combinations of atoms that combine with combinations of atoms. So it becomes very, very complex. 
Okay, so when, when atoms combine with each other to form some other material, that material is called a molecule. Now, lots of molecules together make wood, paper, plastic, you know, it's a combination. Every part of that is made up of specific molecules. Now, there's a very interesting scientific fact that some will know and many will not know. And that is that all these molecules in this material are busy shaking, they're vibrating. Yeah, I, I know it looks solid, but, but trust me, they're all vibrating. And the level of vibration is a measure of something called their temperature. Everybody knows what temperature is, but hey, if you heat things up, they shake faster. Or conversely, if you make them shake faster, they heat up. Now that's a very, that's a very important concept that we're going to have to carry through the, all of this work, because that's fundamental to how our laser machine works. If you want to understand a little bit more about the principle of things shaking, then there is something called absolute zero. Now that's a temperature of minus 273 degrees C, where when you freeze or lower the temperature down to minus 273, the molecules stop shaking. So that proves the point that molecules shake at room temperature and they will shake even harder at higher temperatures because when you reduce them to absolute zero, they don't shake. If you need to look further, go and Google absolute zero and you can find some interesting stuff there. Now we're going to go on to some vital facts that we need to understand about materials. Now this is the first one that I've already mentioned to you. The magnitude of vibration of an atom or molecule is a measure of its temperature. The more it vibrates, the hotter it is. So you don't have to heat the material up. If you shake it hard enough, it gets hot. And that's difficult for us to do. We can't just pick up a piece of paper, for instance, and, and shake it and expect it to get hot. That's not the way it works. It's the molecules in that paper that need to be stimulated to make them hotter. Now here's the next vital fact that you must remember. Most atoms and molecules are actually stable at room temperature. But every material has got a unique temperature or range of temperatures over which changes will occur. Now those changes could be one of two major types of change. One of them could be a change of state. And a change of state, if you can imagine, is like water. Now, water can exist in a solid form below zero degrees C. It exists in a liquid form between zero degrees C and 100 degrees C. And above 100 degrees C, it becomes vapour. Some people would call that gas, but it's steam. What we're saying is that's a change of state. It's not a change of chemistry because through each one of those three changes, the chemistry remains the same. It is still H2O. Two hydrogens and one oxygen stuck together to form a molecule. Now there is another change which takes place in materials, and that's called a chemical change. Wood is a good example of a chemical change that we will see all the time. We see it as burning, but effectively what it means is we raise the temperature of the wood to a certain level and certain parts of the wood burn off at different temperatures. I use the word burn off. They shake themselves to pieces, basically, at certain temperatures. Now, the molecules that shake off will decide to join up with other molecules. So, very crudely, and this is not what a chemist would tell you, but very crudely, we start off with wood, which is one set of chemicals, we add heat to the equation and we finish up with a pile of ash, which is a different set of chemicals, all made up of the same sorts of atoms, but they've just formed different friendships and made different materials. That's important because, for instance, we should be talking about change of state when we talk about acrylic, because acrylic is very, very similar to water. It does not chemically change when you fire the laser beam at it. It changes its state. Whereas organic materials do go through a chemical decomposition when you heat them up. Well, now we're going to change from materials 
to light. Now we all know what light is because we can see it. Well, not true. This little teeny weeny bit here is the amount of light that we can see with our eyes because our, the retina in the back of our eyes gets excited by these particular frequencies. Now, you can see that this whole spectrum here, which is called the electromagnetic spectrum, has got a different lengths of wave in it. So the light waves are different frequencies, and the frequency is shown along the bottom of this graph, and different wavelengths. Now, we know that our laser beam operates at 10.6 microns wavelength. Now that's somewhere around about here. It's invisible to our eyes. This light is vibrating. It's a wave, and it has a frequency which you can read along this bottom line here. Now, the light that comes from the sun has got a mixture of what we can see here, and there's also a little bit at the bottom here, which is ultraviolet light, which damages your skin and affects your cells. Um, it's also responsible for producing things like vitamin D, um, but too much of it can be dangerous. At the top end here, where we've got the lower frequency, we've got this infrared light. Now there's a lot of infrared light coming from the sun, but if we take a look here, it's up to about two and a half microns wavelength. So it's still nowhere near the 10 micron wavelength of our light that comes from the laser. I dare say that if you ask 99% of people, what can you feel when you stand in the sun? They will say, I can feel it's hot. The sun is 90 million miles away or more. And that would have to be a hell of a strong fire to heat you up from 90 million miles away. Yes, I know the sun is very big and very powerful, but there is a physical property of heat. It cannot travel through a vacuum, and the big distance between the sun and us is mainly vacuum. So there can be no heat traveling from the sun. What's coming from the sun is this infrared light. You can say, surely, sunlight is gonna make me more handsome. How can it heat my skin? So now we get a crossover of information because the magnitude of vibration of an atom or molecule is a measure of its temperature. So the only reason that my skin gets hotter is not because the radiated heat from the sun, but it's the light coming from the sun. And it's only when it hits the skin does it vibrate the molecules and make me feel hot. Well, we've had two vital facts about materials. Now we're gonna have two vital facts about light. Our CO2 laser produces a wavelength of 10.6 microns. Now that particular wavelength is relatively long and it's able to stimulate almost every material that it contacts. But there are two major exceptions which our laser machine exploits. Now you might not recognize metals as being a crystal structure, but in their solid form, they're crystalline. And that crystalline structure produces very interesting and strange reflective properties at 10.6 micron wavelength. Basically, all metals act as mirrors. Some are better than others. And we exploit that fact for the mirrors in our machine. We have either got gold, in my case I've got some copper, or you could have molybdenum. They're all up in the 96, 97 to 99% reflective. Then there is another group of materials, a very, very small group of special materials. They're a bit like crystals of salt. They're not glass. They might look like glass, but they're not glass. And these materials are basically transparent to infrared light. The light passes through. Now, there's a whole subject here which we don't need to talk about, and that's the efficiency of these lenses. I think we've touched on it before. But basically, we've got these two special groups, metals, and this very small group of salt-like materials. Now, everything else, and I do mean everything else, will be vibrated to some degree by the 10.6 micron wavelength of our CO2 laser beam. So, having said that almost everything will be stimulated by the 10.6 micron wavelength, what will happen? If you stimulate the molecules, they go faster. They vibrate more. So they will heat up. But the important thing to remember here is 
the more intense the light, the faster it will heat up and the higher temperature it will achieve. So it's the intensity of the light that's the important thing when we fire a laser beam at materials. But, and this is the big but, there are different attractive forces holding these atoms together. Some of them are very tightly bound together with their companion atoms, and some of them are fairly loosely bonded together. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a silly demonstration here to try and illustrate this point. Now look, the chemists are going to laugh at this, and so are the physicists. But at the end of the day, it's the model that's more important than anything else. This is an atom hanging in space, and it could be a molecule of several atoms hanging together as a group. right? And here we've got my finger, which is a beam of light. And if I go boom, you can see what happens. It goes into vibration. OK, now, if I keep hitting it at the right frequency, it'll stay vibrating, and it'll probably get bigger and bigger and bigger the vibrations. That's based on just a single bond to another atom. Now, if I change the bonding arrangement, my atom is now attached to three other atoms with some sort of attraction. Now, when the light hits it, it's going to be quite difficult to vibrate it. Right? And that's the point. If I hit this at a certain frequency, I may or may not coincide, but sooner or later I will hit it and it will do something. I will be able to vibrate that, but that is a lot more difficult to vibrate that with three attachments than it was with a single attachment. So that's the sort of model that I would like you to think about when you imagine light waves hitting a molecule. Some molecules will vibrate easily and other, and other molecules will not vibrate easily because of the way in which they're attached to other molecules and atoms within their structure. So that's the reason why some materials will be more difficult to heat up than others. We can't stimulate them as easily. Now, a good example of this is wood and acrylic, both of which materials we're familiar with. Acrylic turns to liquid at about 160 degrees C. And it then goes up to no more than about 200 degrees C before it turns to vapour. So from that point of view, it's very much like water. So you would think that because acrylic only has to heat up to 200 degrees C, that it would be very easy to cut it. And in fact, acrylic is actually a very difficult material to cut. If we took a, take a look back at my um, matrix of cutting, you'll see that acrylic is actually pretty poor in relation to wood. Wood cuts very easily, which is really very strange because, first of all, you have to get up to about 250 degrees C before you burn off, and I need to be careful with that, you shake off the cellulose element of it. Then you've got the lignin, which goes up to about 350 degrees C before that disappears. And what you're left with then is carbon. Now, carbon you have to heat up to 3,000 degrees C or more before it disappears into a gas. But how come wood is actually about two or three times easier to cut than acrylic? It's all to do with this material structure. If you have a stiff material, like acrylic, which is what I'm basically claiming this is like acrylic, a very stiff material, difficult to drive into vibration. You can't just throw a beam of light at that and expect it to move. It's got to be a very, very, very intense beam of light to start moving this around. So intensity of light is the important thing that we need to cause destruction. Right. So we've now talked about light, we've talked about materials, but the way that the light and the material interact, and we can see that interaction, is by something that we need to call damage. Now, damage is the result of the light hitting the material, the material going into vibration, and then that vibration being above the critical temperature for something to happen. That's when we see damage. And that's the important thing to remember. We use the light to damage the material. The damage occurs when you exceed certain critical temperatures, and it could be chemical or state of change damage. All right? But what that means is that every material has its own characteristic resistance to damage. 
So damage is related to two things mainly. One of them is the intensity of the light and the second is the exposure time that you allow that light to hit the material. If you put your hand over a candle flame and move it very gently over the top, you'll feel the heat of the candle flame. If you move your hand slower and slower over the candle flame, there will become a point in time when it will burn your skin. Now at that point, a chemical change has taken place in your skin. You have reached the damage threshold for your skin. Now it won't be the same damage threshold for a piece of glass or any other material, but it will be the damage threshold for your skin. And that is related to the energy coming from the flame, the heat energy coming from the flame, and the amount of time that you keep your hand in that flame or over that flame. I think it's pretty damned obvious that if I change the flame from a candle flame to a blow lamp, for example, you're no longer going to be able to do that. Even if you go like that, the chances are that you will burn your hand. So it's the intensity of the flame and the time that will affect the damage threshold to your skin. Okay, so this concept of time and intensity, light intensity, is a very important factor in the way in which we damage the materials with our laser machine. So I hope you can now understand that there are three variables that we're dealing with. The material's resistance to damage, which is its damage threshold, its temperature at which something happens, and then the combination of light intensity and time to exceed that damage threshold. Now, when I did all this work here, one of the things that I hoped was gonna help me were these things. These are energy density maps that I produced for each one of the lenses. Interesting as they are, they did absolutely nothing to help me with what I needed to know. These are actually not a waste of time because they're fascinating, but they don't actually represent the real world that we want to know about when we cut with lenses. These are exactly what they claim to be, which is a map of the energy density in the beam as it passes through a lens. Now, the problem with this is that once we get to the focal point here, we're no longer going into material. We're allowing the beam to expand in its natural straight line as light travels state, and then it hits a piece of material that is below the focus point. And what it's doing, it's mapping the energy density within the beam, which is exactly what I thought I wanted to know. But in reality, I didn't. And that really is the whole almost flash of inspiration that happened when I was on holiday. I'm mapping the wrong thing. I want to know what happens inside the cut, not what happens to the beam. We're now going to look at what happens in reality. This is the nitty gritty bit that you want to get to. Right, now here's a picture of me holding a block of acrylic with a mode burn. Now you've seen me doing this many times before where I expose a block of acrylic to the naked, unfocused laser beam. And what happens is we get a profile of the energy density, as I've called it previously, but really it's a map of the light intensity within the beam itself. And again, you'll remember me showing you that, you know, that is a map of that sort of light intensity where I've got very high intensity light in the middle and low intensity around the outside. So when I measure the actual dimensions of this little distribution here, I can fit it onto a normal distribution that looks like this. And here it is again. And these are to scale roughly the shape that's equivalent to my 60 watts worth of damage for five seconds. Okay, so it's, it's just a starting point with some sort of scale related to it. Now I'm gonna be using two mathematical devices here. The first one is the area under that profile there, under that graph, is equivalent to the power that was used to produce this damage. So I use 60 watts there, so the area under that curve is equivalent to roughly 60 watts of power. 
Okay, so I happen to have, by calculating with my CAD system, I can determine that that area under there is roughly 19 square millimetres. Now, that's device number one, 19 square millimetres equals 60 watts. This curve here of a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution, there are statistically numbers that I can apply to this 60 watts that's underneath here. So the central four millimetres of that beam contains something like 68% of the power. Okay, and then there's 14% in a zone outside that which gets me up to the blue zone and then there's just 2% remaining at the outside. Now the one thing I want you to understand is this is not a graph of power. This shape here is a graph of light intensity. Although we're mixing power with its area underneath the power of the area underneath is just a constant factor that I'm going to be using. Now, although I'm going to be using these red, blue and yellow lines as boundaries when I look at the rays, um, they are not uniform between these boundaries. We've got varying light intensity between each one of these boundaries. And that's something that you've got to keep in mind as we proceed through this explanation. OK, now we can see that this is a 12 millimetre diameter beam passing through a lens. And I happen to have made this the correct scale as well. This is a two inch lens, two inch focal length lens. And we've increased the power intensity to something phenomenal at this point here, which is the focal point. But the focal point is not really a point. It's a spot because the lens that we're using is this Plano convex lens. Now, a plano convex lens has got these strange properties. It's called spherical aberration, where the light rays that come in from the outside cross over here. And the light rays that come in from the centre cross over here. So there is no one single focus point on a plano convex lens. You get this thing that I call fuzzy focus. Now you will often see me drawing rays doing this and I'll get a comment that says hang on that's that's not what a focus point looks like because you know it's a spot well here's why look the light beam looks like this if I if I plot the extremities of that light beam I've got a waist I haven't got a crossover point if I take a single ray from a specific distance away from the centre, I have got that situation. But when I look at it like this, I don't have that. I've got this wasted effect. And that's what people say to me. Hang on, you haven't drawn that correctly because it's like this. Well, the reason why it's like this is because you haven't got a single focus point. Now, that's quite an important point to remember. Because I've already said to you, I think that a plano convex lens cuts better than any other sort of lens that I've come across. Don't know why, but what we're just about to delve into may well explain exactly why. I've drawn the lines coming down like this to point two, but they do not come to a single point. Now, forget what's happening down here because this is just a mirror image of what's happening on the other side of the focus point, all right? In reality, it's not going to do that because rays of light do not travel round corners like this. Rays of light travel in straight lines. That's the crucial thing to remember about this. Now, also, at this point, we've got our normal distribution. Nothing will have changed. We've still got light which is normally distributed because here are my three coloured rays, the reds, the blues and the yellows. And here we've still got the standard distribution of 60%, 68%, 14%, 14 and 2, 2. Now, if I gradually take some steps towards the focus point from this 12 millimetre diameter, halfway down, I get to 6 millimetres, 3 millimetres, 1.5, and I keep halving it, I will eventually get down to the focus point of about 0.2. So let's just see what happens in the beam as I gradually squash it down and make it more intense. 
Now I can use this square area as a mechanism for deciding what's happening. Now as I reduce it to six millimeters, here's what our Gaussian distribution looks like. It's still got 19 square millimeters under this curve. But of course, it's changed its shape. It's got smaller with the same area, therefore it's got taller. And let's reduce it again by 50%, down to three millimeters diameter for the beam. And now look what's happened. And we carry on reducing it by 50% each time. Now look what's happened to the beam. Now, bear in mind, this is not power. The power is the area under the beam, but this is actually a graph of light intensity. So the intensity of the light has shot up considerably. And we're only down at 1.5 millimetres at the moment. 0.75. This is 0.75. This is 0.38. And this is 0.19, that's roughly 0.2. So that's equivalent to 0.2. And look what's happened. I've basically got a straight line. Infinitely thin, incredibly tall. That's the area under there. Still 60 watts of area underneath that, I call it a curve, but it's actually almost a straight line. What you've got to remember is, even though this looks like a virtual straight line, within that straight line, we've still got our intensity distribution exactly the same as it was when it was like this, and you could obviously see it. So up here, the intensity is just astronomical. And I bring you back to the point, intensity equals damage. Okay, times time as well, but hey, you don't need much, you don't need much time to do damage when you've got that much intensity. Now, within my PDF document, We've got this little picture here, which tries to give an impression of the overall scale of what's going on. And what you can clearly see here is the height of the graph. Look, five for 12, 10 for six, 20 for 1.5. Every time I halve the distance across the root of the shape, I get a doubling of the height. So there's roughly a two to one relationship between the foot of the graph and the height of the graph. So the intensity is going up. So squash it down by half and the intensity doubles, which makes perfect sense. Having established that we've got something pretty phenomenal here by way of light intensity, and you must remember that this graph is light intensity. I keep stressing that point because you mustn't regard that as being the light beam, a sharp light beam, because it's not a sharp light beam. It is a graph of intensity of light. Okay, let's make a start. Picture here of five different types of lenses. We've got the compound lens, a one and a half inch, two, two and a half inch, and a four inch lens. Now these are all drawn to scale on the basis that you can clearly see that as we change the focal length, so the angle of the rays coming into the focus point is changing. We'll come on to that later, but for the moment what we're going to do is we're going to concentrate on this two inch lens here. Two or three things to mention. First of all, there is going to be no magic, disappointingly enough. There's no quantum effects. There's no plasma involved. And there's no internal light pipe effects as we have been speculating on. I'm almost embarrassed to explain how simple this actually is. It just uses logic and some obvious facts that we've talked about. But if you combine those facts together, you'll see how we're gonna work this through. Now, just before we start, I must point out that just here, where we've got our little Gaussian distribution shown, in reality, that gets distorted even more. It isn't quite a perfect Gaussian distribution by the time we get to here. Because I'm using a plano convex lens, then we find that we've got the outside, the red zone, reaching its focus point before the blue zone, which reaches its point before the central yellow zone. So we haven't got a perfect Gaussian distribution here. It's a bit distorted, 
but it's distorted to make it even more intense at the center point. Okay, so let's start working through what happens when we cut into this surface that I've drawn here. And to be honest, I'm probably going to ignore the red zone because it's such a small amount of power there that in the time scale that we're talking about, it's gonna have no chance to have any effect at all. So mainly what we're gonna be talking about is the yellow zone and the blue zone. So here we are after just a few microseconds of exposure where just the high, very high intensity central core of the yellow will have an effect. Right, now let's go several milliseconds into the cut and there's been enough exposure time now to fully expose all of the yellow zone. And the yellow zone, remember, it's coming forward, but it, because it hasn't reached its focus point yet, its focus point is here, it's actually increasing in intensity. So it, as, it, as it comes forward like this, it's going to accelerate its penetration. But in that same period that it's taken for the yellow section to jump forward to its focus point, we've hardly had a chance for any of the blue to get enough exposure time to do any damage. So this second picture is all about the yellow zone accelerating forward to reach its focus point. Now in this picture, the orange beam has obviously fully developed into the cut and we've gone past its focus point and now it's gradually increasing in diameter as it pushes forward. Still pushing forward a lot faster than the blue zone. But there's been enough exposure time now for the blue zone to start having an effect. And first of all, it's channeled away the excess material here at the mouth. But if we go back to one of the pictures at the beginning, I just need to point something out to you. If we look carefully at this picture, we shall see that the blue zone at the moment is outside the yellow zone. So the yellow zone will have cleared material away, but then we've got this small zone here, which needs to be cleared away by the blue zone. And that intensity of light reaches this point here. And at that point there, the yellow zone now crosses over because it's going to a much further focus point and it goes outside the blue zone. Okay, so that means that once the blue zone has cleared away this little bit of material here, it's got an absolutely free passage to run through fresh air. Let's call it just fresh air, even though it's full of uh, vapor. But it will travel, the blue rays will travel in straight lines through here, through its focus point, and it will start expanding until it hits the wall just here where the yellow has already cleared away a void. And only at that point there, when the blue ray hits the yellow wall, will it lose its energy, excite atoms and start doing damage. So these yellow and these blue rays that I've drawn here are only for your imagination and guidance. They do not actually exist. So as soon as these blue rays hit the yellow wall, there will be this energy transfer. We shall no longer have a blue ray. What we shall have is excited atoms here, which will heat up. Okay, now the amount of heating that's going to take place in this blue zone and the amount of damage it's going to take in this blue zone is down to yours and my imagination. Because between the yellow zone and the blue zone, there is a degradation of intensity, remember. Maximum intensity still exists in this yellow zone, although it is degrading because the zone is gradually getting bigger. But we've still got this intensity of yellow to blue here. And that's what's happening here. The blue zone is gradually eating away at the yellow wall, but then all of a sudden it loses its intensity and fades off. So that's why this strange shape. Now, this is how I imagine it. You may imagine it differently. In reality, it might be something completely different than this. Now, it might look like the same as the previous picture, but what you've got to remember now is that the previous picture was only part of the picture. Look, here's the focal point for the yellow. And here's the focal point for the yellow now. So just to give you an idea, this is a completely different scale picture. And on this picture, we can see the full depth of cut, which is roughly nine millimeters. Not a lot more to say about this. This is a gradual progression of the same sort of thing. I'm guessing what's happening to the blue zone. I'm guessing what's happening to the, to the yellow zone. But what I do know is that its power, both of the blue zone and the yellow zone, are both decreasing and the loss of light intensity within those zones. Now here we are nearly at full penetration. But I, I anticipate that the blue zone will start reaching a, a, 
almost an energy balance where, yes, there's plenty of time here for damage to be done, but right at the front end here, look, we've got a much narrower progression. It's no longer a sharp curve coming in here as it was here. And that's going to cause this blue zone to probably start running reasonably parallel to the axis of the cut. And the same sort of thing could well be happening to the yellow beam as well. Plus the fact that the yellow beam will be slowing down and we'll be getting a much blunter point here. And at this point here, we've reached roughly 0.4 diameter on the yellow zone. Well, remember the yellow zone started off at 0 0.06. So that's roughly about 1 sixth or 1 seventh of the power that it started off with at the beginning of the cut. So the light intensity here has now dropped off quite dramatically. And now what I've drawn here is the final shape of the beam. Now I've put the final shape of the beam as a sort of a black outline round the cut, just so that it becomes more obvious roughly what we've got. And proportionately I've tried to show how much of the damage has been caused by the blue zone and how much damage has been caused by the yellow zone. And as you can see, as the yellow zone pierces out the bottom of the material, we've got this sharp point which drops out the bottom. So it doesn't drop out as a full beam width. In, if I follow just the rays, I get a very narrow neck here. But I think that what's happening, there's a practical, pragmatic situation taking place here at this neck. And that is that as we go in here and convert solid material to vapor, that vapor is got to find its way out of the tube somehow. And as it finds its way out of the tube, it's a very hot vapor. I think that it will probably have a scourging effect on this neck and there will be some additional cutting and growth that takes place on this little bottleneck here because of the exiting hot fields. Now at the end of the last video, I took this progressive beam growth for a two inch lens. And each one of these intervals here is one thousandths of a second apart, one millisecond. Okay, so here's the rate of growth that we talked about. It grows quite quickly to start with, but then all of a sudden it starts to slow down. Now, if we compare my prediction, there's a reasonable amount of similarity, but we have got a smaller entry point, and then we can clearly see this slight barreling that takes place down in the center of the cut. And then we've got this narrowing towards the bottom of the cut before it just drops out the bottom. Now, this is not a perfect replication of reality, but as I've admitted to you, that I'm just guessing and estimating what's going on inside the cut. The logic of what's going on is absolutely correct. I'm 100% sure of that. But the magnitude of each one of these effects is just guesswork. Now, one of the things that struck me quite forcefully as I was drawing this image was the way in which the beams are diverging after the internal focus point. Now, remember, this is intensity, beam intensity, and as it diverges, the intensity drops off. Let's just go back to that first picture that I showed you. Well, I did mention the different divergence, convergence and then divergence of the beam after the focal point. But we did point that out to you earlier, that these focal points down here are not the same as the nominal focal point that is classed as the focus point for the lens. What that means is that this yellow section here, which is where most of the power is and most of the damage is being done, is actually much narrower here on a two and a half inch lens than it is on a two inch lens. Now, I know that as a result of this work, that I have now swapped my two inch favored gallium arsenide lens to a two and a half inch lens for cutting because I actually find it's a better cutting lens. Now, that's just me personally on my machine. Now look, I've just drawn, on this drawing, I've drawn a five times scale picture of what's happening just here at each one of these points. This is nine millimeter material again, and this is the way in which the light rays are squirting into that nine millimeter material. 
Now I think it's pretty damned obvious that here, where I've got a very short focus compound lens, look at the way the rays are squirting in. Okay, this is certainly no good as a cutting lens because look at the divergence that's taking place in the rays as we reach the end. Now, again, these rays are only there for imagination. They're trying to tell you that the energy density of any ray that's going into this material has greatly decreased by the time it gets to this point here, as opposed to what happens when it enters the material. Okay, so don't get the impression that this is a cut. This is only an indication of the intensity of the light. And the intensity of the light is, remember, the amount of damage that you potentially can do to the material. So let's look at the width of this and see what the damage potential is for each one of these lenses. So as this one exits, look, it's much narrower and narrower and narrower. So my two and a half inch lens retains its intensity for much longer as it passes through the cut. So it remains very, very high all the way through. And then we get this one, which is the four inch lens, which when you take it to its logical conclusion says, well, if I'm further away with the focus point, I'm gonna get a narrower convergence of the beam, which means I'm gonna get a much narrower divergence of the beam. And look, we've got virtually nothing there compared to some of these other lenses. And that set me thinking, hey, does that mean to say that a four inch lens is what we should all be using? Is it a powerful lens? Because I've never thought of it in that way before. This principle of spot size that people have been ramming down our throats for years. With a two inch lens, we've got a diameter, spot diameter of around about 0.1 millimeters. A two and a half inch lens has got a spot diameter of about 0.2. And a four inch lens has got a spot diameter of about 0.4. Now, when you look at that in terms of area, which is the most important part of this, this is an area of, let's just call it one, this is an area of two, and this is an area of about four. Now this is just a coincidence that I've happened to make these numbers the same, but this is approximately the area difference. If I'm trying to push 60 watts through each one of these focal points, spot sizes, it means I've got a quarter of the energy density here. And of course, quarter of the energy density, which is the term that we've been using up to now, sounds as though we're going to get a quarter of the cutting power. Hmm. That's based on the fact that things are happen linearly across this area. And we now know that it isn't happening linearly. It's happening in a very non-linear fashion. So, my prediction based on this, as I was drawing this image, says a four inch lens has got to be the best thing since sliced bread. Let's do some tests. Now this is exactly the same test procedure that I used previously. Instead of one millisecond intervals, I used two millisecond intervals. So here we've got 50 tests which take us out to 100 milliseconds. The material thickness in this case, I found a piece of 10 millimeter material. Here's what happens when we put the compound lens in. We can see this barreling of what I would class as the blue zone as having a big effect. It's almost at the same depth as this rather strange little peak here, which I suspect is probably the yellow zone. But it's certainly growing very, 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 very slowly and with a weird shape, which is gradually getting more and more bulbous as the blue has more and more time to excavate away the walls of the tube. We're not progressing very far, and so the blue zone is keeping up almost with the yellow zone. Now, when we move on to the inch and a half lens, we're coming into some sort of half decent cut by the look of it. Now this is looking much more like my cut. I've missed the two inch lens out and we've gone straight to a two and a half inch lens. Now remember the two and a half inch lens has got a much more intense yellow zone. And that's beginning to show with these pictures because look, all the way through, we've got a little intense section right at the front here, where obviously the yellow beam is having its cutting effect. 
But we can gradually see as time progresses down here, the way in which this scourging, this barreling is taking place in the cup caused by what I'm proposing is the blue zone gradually making it grow. And then we get to this last one. Wow. We've punched our way through the 10 millimeter material, not in 100 milliseconds as we managed to do here with my now favorite two and a half inch lens. We've done it in 56 milliseconds. Phenomenal. So why aren't we all using four inch lenses for cutting? Because we should all jump in and buy four inch lenses on the basis of this. It's got such a great penetrative power and look, we're getting no barreling because the cut is taking place so quickly and with such high intensity, even the blue zone has nearly, well, the blue zone here is got more power than it has on the two inch lens. Look, I was overjoyed at this until I remembered one thing. So when I study my cutting matrix, I find that actually the four inch lens is not as good at performing a cut as a two and a half inch lens. Four inch lens, two and a half inch lens. Four inch lens, two and a half inch lens. So cutting data is not giving me the same results as the theoretical and my test data with piercing. Well, that was me thinking that this was the end of the saga. I'd done it. I understood it all. We've got conflicting data. Now, one is a pierce and the other is a cut. Does that mean to say that the open-sided cut is causing a different performance characteristic to when we're just piercing into the material? That's another story. Join me next time. I might give lenses a bit of a rest for a little while and get on with some other things that I need to do, but this is something that we shall definitely have to come back to. I feel very confident that I understand how cutting and why cutting takes place. And I hope I've convinced you guys of the same. So until next time, bye for now. Thanks for your time.